So this is going to be my favorite unit, differential equations, unit 7. Now, differential equations is sort of like an offshoot of the integral because we're uh, trying to unite sort of the, um, the ideas of derivatives and integrals here. So let's, let's get started. What exactly is a differential equation? So a differential equation is an equation that, as you might infer, models the rate of change of a function. So back when we did implicit differentiation, you would get uh, dy dx equals something like x plus y squared, for example. Okay, that's a differential equation. Differ or differential equations have the derivative of y with respect to x, or the derivative of population with respect to time, on the left side of the equal sign, and on the right side of the equal sign, they have some equation, okay? Now, the interesting thing about uh, differential equations, as you saw with all of the other derivatives, is they can have an infinite number of antiderivatives, because there's an infinite number of constants, some constant c, that you can add to the antiderivative. Okay, so... First, uh, the major uh, way you're going to see this pop up on a multiple choice question is that you're going to have to see that they're going to give you a differential equation. It's going to look something like that. And they're going to give you a number of solutions as multiple choice uh, answers. And you need to go through each of those solutions and you need to verify which one is a solution to the differential equation and which one is not. And what we mean by solution is you're given a differential equation and your job is to find the original equation. Okay, so instead of this, how about I give you guys dy dx equals, what do I have here? 4y over x. Okay? Now, it is... If you're just looking at this for the first time, it would be pretty difficult to try and find an equation whose derivative is that. But luckily, uh, on the multiple choice portion of the exam, you'll be given answer choice. Choice A, y equals uh, 2x squared. Choice B, y equals um, 4x over uh, 2x squared plus 1. You know, they give you a bunch of equations as multiple choice answers, and your job is to figure out which one is the possi can possibly be the original equation from which this differential equation is the derivative of. Okay, so let's, let's work through these. Let's see if any of these satisfy our differential equation up here. Let's see where this becomes dy dx equals... 4x. No. This one becomes uh, low d high minus high d low all over low squared. No, that doesn't look like it either. Let me give you a third option y equals x to the fourth. Let's see if this one satisfies our equation. That one gives us dy dx equals 4x to the third. That doesn't look the same, but that's the magic of differential equations. They try to trick you, okay? This d differential equation has a y in it we're given y equals x to the fourth. Okay, we've got here a y over x. So y over x equals x to the fourth over x equals x to the third. Oh, that looks familiar, doesn't it? If x to the third is the same as y over x, then 4y over x equals 4x to the third. 
four y over x equals four x to the third, which we have here, meaning c is our correct answer. Okay, that's the sort of loop-de-loop -loop they try to throw with at you with differential equations. Oftentimes, almost every time, you will have to substitute the original function for y into the differential equation. But Khan Academy's got some great practice problems with differential equations. Honestly, they have, they're the best. They're who you should go to for all your practice. If you need extra help with anything, you know, I got a Discord server, a link down below. I don't charge, just come to me, ask questions. I'd be more than happy to help you. Anyway, uh, in form of multiple choice or FRQ, uh, differential equations are presented to you in the form of a slope field. Now let's get into what slope fields are. Okay, so let's continue with this differential equation right here. dy dx equals 4y over x. And the slope field is a coordinate plane. A normal function follows a well-defined, possibly curved, possibly linear path throughout the plane, okay? But a slope field is a field of possible routes that a function can take. Uh, sometimes uh, you'll be given a slope field on a multiple choice and you'll have to uh, tell whether or not it fits the differential equation, or sometimes you'll be given just a coordinate plane on an FRQ and you'll have to draw the slope field. So again, let's get right into what slope fields are. You're given a differential equation, okay? Remember, a derivative or a differential equation represents the slope of a function at any given point, okay? Meaning, if I wanted to, if I was concerned of my original function, f of x, okay? If I wanted to know f prime of uh, f prime of x at the point one comma two, then I would just plug in one and two into my differential equation, and I would get the slope. Pretty simple, right? Just review right now. So point uh, x value one is four times two over one equals a slope of eight. Okay. That means over on our graph here at the point uh, 1, 2, this point right here, it would have a slope of 8. A very steep line. Okay. Now, let's draw, let's try another point. How about 1, 1? That would be a slope of 4. A less steep line. How about uh, 4 comma 4? That would be also a slope of 4. And what we're doing here is we're drawing out what the slope would be at any of these given points, okay? If this was an FRQ, you'd be given a much more constricted graph. But let me continue drawing out a good amount of the points that I can here in the first quadrant, and I'll come back to you guys. So I'm not sure if this shows up very well on camera, but if you can see along the x-axis, all of the slopes are flat, and if you can see along the y-axis, all of the slopes are straight up. Now that makes perfect sense, because if you come back to our uh, differential equation, along the y-axis, I mean, excuse me, along the x-axis, all the y-values are zero. And if our numerator is zero, we have got a zero slope. And along the y-axis, all the x-values are zero. Our denominator is always zero, so we always have an undefined slope. Okay? And everywhere in between, um, as you get further and further uh, in the positive x-directions, the slopes become flatter. They become more to zero, as you can see here. We start with a slope of 8, then 4, then 2, then 1, then 1 half, then etc., etc., and if we keep increasing our y value, uh, the y, the slope doubles. Slope, in, it's increasing. Slope is increasing as we increase our y value. 
So as the y values get larger and larger, our slope deviates closer and closer to infinity, and our x values get larger, our slope converges closer and closer to zero. But as you can see with this four in the numerator, the slope grows to infinity much faster than it grows to zero. And now that we have this slope field, now that we know what the slope would be at any point, we can try sketching different graphs, okay? What different graphs would look like. And very often what you'd be told to do on an FRQ is you'd be given a slope field and you'd say, uh, draw the graph that passes through some point, let's say the point uh, 1 comma 1, all right? Let's say we pass through that point. Well, 1 comma 1, first of all, our slope is 4 here. So one point would be here, then we would follow the slope up 4 points to here. Then here, what would our slope be? Our slope would be um, 8. So we would follow the slope up 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And you can see that this function uh, is already starting to look like an exponential function. Okay? All of that from us being given an initial point, also called an initial condition. Okay? And the function looking like an exponential function makes perfect sense with the solution we got earlier in my multiple choice example. So that's slope fields. Uh, drawing them should be pretty simple. It's just plug the x and y coordinate into the differential equation, and that's the slope at that point in the slope field. Uh, drawing a graph that passes through this point is pretty simple. You just start at that point, and then, okay, what's the slope at this point? The slope's four. Let me go four up, one to the right. What's the slope at that point? Oh, the slope's eight. Let me go eight up, one to the right. And that's how you draw slopes on slope, that's how you draw graphs on slope fields. However, if we said uh, the graph that passes through the point 1 comma 2, we are asserting that the, the solution to our differential equation passes through the point 1 comma 2. So how would we do that? Uh, when x equals 1, x to the fourth equals 1, and y equals 2. So our plus c here would be plus 1. Okay, so if we were given the point 1 comma 2, we would be drawing the, the, the uh, slope field, excuse me, we would be drawing the curve through the slope field of this equation, all right? Remember, the graph you are drawing through a slope field is the graph of your original function. The slopes, the tick marks that you're drawing on your slope field are the values of your differential equation, okay? And whatever point, whatever initial condition you're given, from that you can derive the plus c value of the, differ of the original function that you're evaluating, okay? So this right here is the graph of y equals x to the fourth. Okay, now uh, next topic is uh, something called Euler's method. <laughs> I remember when I learned Euler's method. I was a bit behind on my uh, self-study schedule, so I was uh, teaching this to myself while waiting for my food in the diner. But that's, that's a story for another time. Anyway, Euler's method. It's a uh, way for approximating the values of an original function, okay? So let's continue with this same uh, differential equation. I like this. dy dx equals 4y over x, okay? You're always going to be given your differential equation. And Euler's method states, in order to use Euler's method, you would be given an original x value, let's say x equals 1, and an original y value, let's say y equals 1. You'd be given an initial condition, an initial coordinate. And Euler's method states that... Um, you can approximate the value of uh, a function, 
that is some small distance away from your initial condition by using the, the differential, the slope that your differential equation provides you. It's pretty much the same thing as local linear approximation, except multiple times, okay? So, if you remember local linear approximation from our applications of the derivative video, uh, you would remember that uh, on a function, you'd be given some point, you'd, you'd find the tangent line to set point, and you'd approximate some value on the function by approximating uh, that value on the tangent line. Well, this is very similar. It's just multiple iterations of the same principle. So when they ask you to use Euler's methods to approximate, let's say, uh, y equals 2, and no, I'm sorry, x equals 2, you're approximating the y value at x equals 2, y equals question mark, that's what we're looking for. They would say, using Euler's method with uh, two steps or with four subdivisions or something along those lines, okay? And what that means is you would uh, take your target x value minus your original x value which in this case equals 1, and you would divide that by your amount of subdivisions, let's say 4, okay? So that means each step we take is 1 fourth. So 1 fourth. So let's, let me show you how to do Euler's method. It's very, uh, it's, it's highly recommended to make a chart here. On this side of the chart you put your x value, this is your y, and this is your dy dx. So our initial condition, x equals 1, y equals 1, and our dy dx is 4. Okay? The next step is 1 fourth further, 1.25. Okay? Then we do a local linear approximation. The change in x, 0.25, times our slope, which is 4, 0.25 times 4 is 1. And that 0.25 times 4 is our change in y. 1 would be our change in y, so y would equal 2 here. Now let me redo what I just did for some clarity. We took our change in x, which was 0 0.25, which was our step value, how large our steps are, we multiplied that by the value of dy dx, which is the same as 4. 0 0.25 times 4 is 1. Okay, 4 here represents the slope of our tangent line. 0.25 represents the distance. And therefore, 1 represents the change in y, how much we added or subtracted from y. Okay, so we take our original y value and we add that value to it, so we get y equals 2 at x equals 1.25. And then we calculate dy dx again. dy dx would be 8 over 1.25, which uh, is the same as... So dy dx would be 8 over 1.25, which is the same as 8 over 5 over 4, which is the same as 32 over 5 dy dx is 32 over 5. Okay, that's a pretty big number there. And usually when you would come across a problem like this, they wouldn't give you numbers that bad. So for simplicity's sake, I'm just going to pretend that this says 8, okay? We're just going to pretend that says 8 for the sake of showing you how this problem works. So again, you would do the same process. You would do your change in x, 0 0.25, times the value of dy dx, which is 8, and you would get 2. That's your change in y. You add that to your original y value. 2 plus 2, okay, 1.5 now, we're at 1.5. 2 plus 2 is 4, and then you would calculate dy dx again. 
and you would keep iterating through this process until you get to x equals 2. And then in here would be your approximation of y at x equals 2. You don't need to calculate dy dx here because you already have your y value, you're done. And that's Euler's method. It's a pretty tricky learning curve, but it should be fast to learn with a bit of practice on Khan Academy. That's why differential equations is my favorite unit. It seems daunting, but with like 10 minutes of practice, you start to get it pretty easily. Okay, what's our next topic? This is the real meat and potatoes of uh, differential equations, and this is uh, separable differential equations, okay? Now, if you have anyone who's uh, doing differential equations in college, they'll tell you that you're being babied right now. But regardless, we're here with Calc BC. This is not AP differential equations, so we're just gonna, we're just gonna graze on it. So a separ separable differential equation would be something like dy dx. Uh, do I have an example here? Yeah, let's let's use our uh, let's use the original one we've been using this whole time. Dy dx equals four y times x. A separable differential equation is a differential equation that you can separate the variables in. That's why it's called separable. We've got dx and x, and we've got dy and y. So if I divide both sides by y, then I should get 1 over y dy dx equals 4 over x. And if I multiply both sides by dx, I get 1 over y dy equals 4 over x dx. Now we have separate variables. We've got y dy on one side and we've got x dx on the other. That is something we can integrate. We can take the integral of both sides, because remember, what you got to do to one side, you got to do the other. We can take the indefinite integral of 1 over y dy, and we can set that equal to the integral of 4 over x dx. And, you know, these are simple integrals. You can solve this out. That would be uh, natural log of the absolute value of y equals 4 times the natural log of the absolute value of x. And that can be rewritten as natural log the absolute value of y equals the natural log of the absolute value of x to the fourth. And then what we can do here is since x to the fourth is always positive, it always lies above the x-axis, we can get rid of these absolute value bars. We can replace them with normal parentheses. And then we can raise both sides to the, I mean, we can put both sides with e as a base. We can take e and raise it to both sides, and we get y equals x to the fourth, which is precisely the value we got here. That is our general solution. Remember, we don't want to forget our plus c. Still has a plus c there. So, you can solve for a particular solution to a differential equation if you are given an initial condition. We talked about initial conditions here, and you're going to see initial conditions again. You're always only ever going to be able to solve for general solutions. You're only ever going to be able to get plus C unless you're given an initial condition. And let's say our initial condition is uh, X equals one, Y equals six. Okay, in that case, when we plug uh, one in for X, Y equals six, our C would equal five. Therefore, Y equals X to the fourth plus five. And that's your final equation. Separable differential equations, the hardest part is just figuring out how to separate the variables. Usually once you've done that, it should be pretty simple to 
integrate. You know, we've done integration for so long now. I think our integration video was our longest video here on the channel, but integration should not be what you're struggling with. It should really be just figuring out how to separate them. From there, it's pretty simple. And uh, rule of thumb, if you're doing this on uh, FRQ, on the APBC exam, always put your function in terms of y. Get y by itself, if at all possible. Which, if it's a separable differential equation, you will always be able to get y by itself. Okay, so I want to take the time now to show you the two most popular forms of differential equations that uh, tend to pop up on the BC exam. Uh, and these will pop up generally in FRQs because FRQs always include some sort of context, some sort of application, some sort of real world meaning. And that's uh, exponential growth or exponential decay, whatever the case may be, exponential something, and uh, logistic, logistic curves. Uh, I'll often use to uh, often use to model population dynamics. If you took AP Bio, you're very well acquainted with that type of function. Okay, so exponential growth decay takes the form of a differential equation of uh, say ds dt equals some constant k multiplied by s. Okay, where s is, let's say, let's, uh, what could s equal? Let's say uh, s equals, s equals the population. And ds dt is the rate of change of the population. Okay, so this, like the differential equation we uh, looked at down here, is a separable differential equation. So let's separate it. Um, let's multiply both sides by dt. You get ds equals ks dt. Let's divide both sides by s. 1 over s ds equals k dt. You integrate both sides. 1 over s is ln absolute value s equals uh, kt. Okay. You're given S is population. You know you can never have a negative population. Therefore, these absolute value bars disappear and you can replace them with parentheses. Be careful to pay attention to the real world application of your math, okay? If the problem uh, dictates something like that, something like population, which is always positive, you'll be able to remove your absolute value bars and replace it with a normal natural log. Okay, now, if we want to put this uh, just in terms of s, if we want to isolate s, we can simply say s equals Oh, yes, of course. Uh, don't forget your plus c. Remember, don't, don't be like me, don't make those silly mistakes. Now from here, you just simply take e and raise e to both sides e to the natural log of s equals e to the kt plus c, and that becomes s equals e to the kt plus c, well, more accurately, s of t, because this is a function of population. But, if you remember from your pre-calc days, any addition within an exponent can be broken up as such. S of t is the same as e to the k, e to the kt, multiplied by e to the c. Because when you multiply like bases, you add the exponents. And if you've got addition in your exponent, you can break it up into two like bases. Now if we look here, e, some constant number, 2.7 something, c is some constant number. So a constant raised to a constant is a constant. Therefore, s of t equals c times e to the kt. We just took this and replaced it with some other constant c. And that's 
the solution to an exponential growth differential equation. Okay, so um, when you're given a logistic growth curve on the BC exam, if you're given one, uh, I had one on my BC exam, so I figure it might be important. Um, they're not going to ask you to solve for a solution like they do here. They're going to ask you questions about it, but it's a lot more difficult to solve for a solution to a logistic curve, so they don't, they don't bother asking you to solve for a solution. So we're going to use the example, what do I have here? Uh, 90 minus 3n over 20 times n equals dn dt, where n is the population. Now those of you in AP Bio know that population can often be modeled by a logistic curve. For those of you who don't know what a logistic curve is, a logistic curve is a curve that uh, starts out low, gains speed, gain, grows really fast, and then levels out. That's a logistic curve, okay? It levels out at the top because the population has reached its carrying capacity, okay? This bar up here represents the upper bound, represents the carrying capacity. Okay, so uh, some of the most common questions that they would ask you uh, for a logistic curve, uh, logistic differential equation, FRQ, would be questions like, A, um, what is the carrying capacity? What is the population when the population is, gr is growing fastest? Okay, now this second part B is the one that trips a lot of kids up, but I'm going to walk you guys through exactly how to solve this. This is actually very similar to the FRQ I had on, uh, on my exam. I'm not allowed to tell you that it's the exact same one because then the college board, there'd be a lot of problems with the college board and the non-disclosure. It's, it's not the same one. Okay? It's not the same one. It's the same one. Okay. What is the carrying capacity? So as we saw here on uh, the curve, the carrying capacity is when our slope is zero. Simple enough. You guys know how to solve that. You set dn dt equal to zero equals 90 minus 30, uh, sorry, 3n over 20 times n, and you would solve for when n equals zero, okay? This n on the outside is zero when the population is zero, when we're here. Okay, we're not looking for when the population is zero, we're looking for the carrying capacity. So we're looking for when this term is zero. Rule of thumb. Anyway, part B. What is the population when the population is growing fastest? Okay, so it says here growing. That means when the uh, rate of change of the population is positive, and when the rate of change of the population is at a maximum. So that's what's fastest means maximum rate. So we're going to have to find the derivative of dn dt and set that equal to zero because if you remember from our graphical analysis unit, relative maximums only occur when the derivative of a function is zero. So if we're trying to find the maximum of dn dt, we're going to need to find when the derivative of dn dt is zero. Okay, so you would take this whole function right here, 90 minus 3n over 20 quantity times n, and you would have to differentiate that whole thing. So that's just product rule. It's a bit time consuming which is why a lot of uh, kids get tripped up on this. 
they usually don't put uh, time consuming stuff like product rule and quotient rule on FRQs, but out of the eight FRQs, it, ha it usually happens at least once. So you gotta be prepared for when it hits you and it usually shows up on the differential equation FRQ or the parametric polar coordinate FRQ, which is next unit, two units from now, excuse me. So you take uh, 90 minus 30, 3n over 20. Uh, so let's see, uh, first times the derivative of the second plus the second times the derivative of the first, which would be um, negative 3 over 20. Right? Yeah, negative 3 over 20. Okay. So, you got to set this equal to 0. That would re require a good bit of factoring. 90 minus 3n over 20 minus... Three n over twenty equals zero. So ninety minus six n over twenty equals zero. Multiply this. One eight zero zero minus six n equals zero. One eight zero zero equals six n. Uh, what would that be? Three hundred equals n. So the population is growing the fastest when the population is. 300. That's all of differential equations, guys. Enjoy life.